Inga's announcement that, while she loved him, she just wasn't in love with him anymore, did not come as much of a surprise to Dr. Claude Iverneck. They had not been emotionally close for several weeks now. The engineer looked at his wife, still beautiful after 24 years of marriage, and nodded his head in agreement. When he had met the German-born beauty in Cologne, Germany, he had fallen hard for her. She had likewise fallen for the college student. Theirs had been a romance, a marriage to be admired. Theirs had been a love that they believed would last forever, even as time and distance had taken its toll. Inga's next statement did surprise the stoic engineer, though, when she announced that she was moving in with her partner. What? he asked, his Germanic accent becoming more pronounced. You have a partner? She looked at him with disdain. After a moment, he simply shrugged his shoulders. Yes, and Jerome? He doesn't want kids, Inga stated. But, but you mean you are leaving Charles here? With me? Claude asked, referring to their four-year-old son. When Inga had discovered that she was pregnant, they were both surprised. Their other two children were already grown up, so having a young child in the house was an unexpected joy for Claude. He had seen it as a new chapter in their long-lasting love story. Inga's declaration that she did not love him, had a partner, and was leaving Charles with him, did shake Claude. Suddenly, his whole life had changed in less than one minute. Yes, maybe you have to be a father now, huh? Inga snapped, her beautiful features changing from a sneer to amusement. I am a father, he comes with me to work, every day Claude snapped back. Since Claude Jr. and Heather were 21 and 20 years old, and attending university in Hamburg, Germany, custody of their oldest two children was not an issue. But a lively four-year-old boy needed the love and care of both his mother and father. With a final farewell nod, Inga took her five suitcases, put them into her Mercedes-Benz, and left their home. Claude immediately took charge and checked their bank accounts. Inga had already withdrawn 50% of the money, so he closed the accounts and transferred the remaining money into a new account. He then canceled their three credit cards for safety reasons. The next step was to reprogram the garage door's code and the alarm system's passcode. Then he and Charles went to the Home Depot in LG, Louisiana to purchase new locks for all the doors. Charles loved the Home Depot store he and his father often bought new magnets and steel screws and nuts and bolts for the magnet to pick up. This time, Claude bought a large bolt, a large 9-volt battery, and a spool of wire. Arriving home again, Father and son sat at the workbench in the four-car garage of the Baylor Lake home, and Claude showed his son how to make an electromagnet. Wow! This is amazing, Dad Charles exclaimed, amazed by their creation. It can even pick up a wrench. Charles gasped in awe at the power of the magnet. After his dinner, his bath, and a bedtime story, Charles lay down for a good night's sleep. Claude looked down at his little boy and sighed. What kind of mother would leave her baby? He asked himself. Then he changed all the locks in the house. If Inga wanted to come back for any forgotten items, she would have to contact him first. And Jerome? I hope you have plenty of money she spends it quickly, Claude said, fixing himself a soft drink. Jerome did not have plenty of money and decided that a 42-year-old woman with expensive tastes and no income to support them was not something he wanted to be tied to. Being the part-time companion of a beautiful woman had been fun and exciting for a while. He didn't have to worry about keeping a clean home or listening to her nagging complaints. He didn't have to move her undergarments out of the way when he wanted to shower or put the toilet seat down after he used it. He only had to spend time with her romantically, help her spend her husband's money, and then go back to his apartment while she cleaned up for her husband. This was especially true when Claude contacted Inga to let her know he would be canceling her cell phone service and her automobile insurance, as well as the payments on the luxury car. Jerome let Inga know that while it had been enjoyable, it was time for her to move on. Inga now fought the divorce. Nicole Banks, her attorney, requested counseling. The time for counseling is before she decided to be with another partner, Penny Jones, doctor. Ivernex's attorney argued, but Judge Marie Robico decreed that there should be no less than eight counseling sessions. Claude accepted the decision with a shrug. The counseling sessions were fruitless. Claude did not want to reconcile and Inga was too proud to admit she had made a mistake. Doctor. Sylvia Hooperstein had to admit that there was no way forward for this couple. Nicole then applied for Inga to have custody of Charles Jonathan Iverneck. But because Inga had willingly left her child, Charles remained with his father while the parents battled in court over custody. Inga demanded full custody, along with high child support and the marital home, 
which was the child's primary residence. Inga would not agree to joint custody with Claude as the primary custodian. Therefore, their custody battle had to enter mediation. Claude did not make any smug remarks when he was granted primary custody. He did not brag when Inga was not awarded any child support. He did not boast when he was allowed to remain in the marital home as Charles's primary residence until he reached adulthood. Forget it, Nicole snapped when Inga brought up the idea of receiving alimony. You left the marital home willingly, you moved in with a partner. Courts do not reward infidelity, Mrs. Iverneck. The most you will receive is 50% of the assets accumulated during the marriage. Then Nicole reminded Inga of the thousands of dollars she owed for legal representation. Inga asked why she should have to pay any of it when Nicole hadn't won her a single thing she wanted. Shortly after his divorce was finalized, Claude was called into tough Richard's office. The young CEO of Kendrick's Engineering had the plans for a whitehead generator on his desk. Both he and Claude looked at the plans together. We can make it smaller, tough stated with confidence. Since Marcus died last year, they haven't secured the patent for this. They've just been producing the same old stuff. I'll get back to you, Claude promised. I want it smaller and more efficient, tough ordered. At home, Claude and his son played with Charles's toys, his trucks, and bulldozers. Then Charles wanted to play with his electromagnet. Electromagnetism. We harness the power of magnetism, Claude hypothesized out loud. And there's a positive and a negative pole, Charles reminded his father. Yes, you're a genius, my boy. You are exceptionally bright, Claude laughed, hugging his son. That night, as Charles lay in his bed, Dreaming about trucks and cranes and bulldozers and magnets, Claude scribbled frantically. At 7.30 the next morning, Corliss, his housekeeper, walked in and found Claude still scribbling. Oh, shoot. Claude laughed. Miss Corliss, I'll give you $100 to make Charles breakfast. All right, is grits okay? Corliss asked. Grits are great, Claude agreed. Tuff looked at Claude's rough sketches and the plans for the whitehead generator. Did you even look at these? He asked, pointing to the whitehead plans. No, no, this is a different kind of generator, Claude stated. I couldn't agree more, Tuff replied. Claude blinked when Tuff rewarded him with a $100,000 bonus for creating the key Charles generator. It also delighted Claude to no end that Tuff Richards named the new generator after Claude's beloved son. While Dr. Claude Iverneck was in his office at Kendrick's Engineering, contemplating what to do with his $100,000 bonus, Su Lin was sitting on a sandy stretch of land known as the Bend. The bend was just a curve in a small creek that ran alongside Stepping Stone, Louisiana. The small town was mainly made up of trailer parks. The only permanent establishments were the grocery store, the liquor store, the Dairy Queen, and the Stepping Stone Diner. Even John F. Kennedy High School was a series of eight mobile buildings arranged in two rows of four. Sweet Gum Paper Mill and the Hearst Women's Prison were the two main sources of employment in Penny Parish, and at the moment, neither were hiring. The 18-year-old girl flicked her ankle-length blonde hair back and sighed. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do. She had just graduated, barely, from JFK and was now sitting, wondering what her next move should be. Her friend Nicholas was at work. He worked at the loading bay of Sweet Gum Paper Mill. Nicholas's girlfriend Angela was at home, waiting to give birth to their baby. Joanne was now married to another woman. The two lived in Baylor Lake, Louisiana. Bobby was still in jail awaiting trial. There wasn't much backlog of cases, but there was no public defender available. Eric had joined the Marines. Su Lin had last heard that he was stationed in Japan. Her very best friend April had decided that there was nothing for her in Stepping Stone and had hitched a ride with a trucker heading for Jackson, Mississippi. Su Lin didn't even know if April was still in Jackson or if she had moved on. Su Lin watched as a small branch floated along the nearly dry creek. There hadn't been any rain for a few weeks now if this drought continued, the creek would dry up completely. On one hand, Su Lin was glad she had quit smoking. It tasted bad, smelled worse, and was so expensive. Paying $6.50 for a pack of cigarettes was ridiculous. On the other hand, she missed having something to occupy her hands, occupy her mind. With a sigh, she got to her feet and brushed the sand off her shorts. With another sigh, she turned and walked back home. That April girl called here, I thought you said she had left her mother snapped when Su Lin entered the trailer. She did, she went to Jackson, I believe Sue Lin confirmed. Did she leave her number? She said she'd call back her mother said, already engulfed in her television show. Sue Lin sighed. Knowing April, that could mean in five minutes or five days. 
Or if April had been drunk when she called, it might mean she would never call back. April had been somewhat serious when she'd called earlier that day. Within 20 minutes after Sue Lin had entered the trailer, April called again. Don't like you hanging around with that girl, know how Su Lin's mother snapped when she handed the cordless telephone to Su Lin. Su Lin didn't respond to her mother's declaration. No response she gave would be good enough. Her mother had been disappointed with Su Lin Benning from the moment she was born. Su Lin had been two hours and 21 minutes too early to be the first Louisiana baby born in the new millennium. She'd also been too early to be the last baby born in the old millennium. The cycle of disappointment and resentment had started with her birth and there seemed to be no way to break it. Added to the disappointing time of her birth, the fact that Su Lin had been born without certain parts of her body had greatly disappointed her father. He already had seven daughters with five different women and had promised Jacqueline Benning the world if she would give him what he craved. Hey, what's up? April yelled drunkenly into the phone. Hey, where are you? Su Lin asked. I'm in Oakleaf, Texas. I told you that April laughed. Oak. No, you didn't. Last I heard, you were in Mississippi, Sue Lynn said. April described her life in the Texas town. She was dancing at Tijuana Jack's, a club, and loved it. She never paid for drinks and usually came home with a lot of money each night. She was staying with another dancer in a rented house. You need to come up here, girl April enthusiastically said. I mean, I'm not as pretty as you and the money they're giving me. Sue Lynn wrote down the telephone number that was on the caller ID screen and verified the number with April. April drunkenly agreed that she thought that might be the phone number it was her roommate's phone number. Su Lin waited until her mother was in the bathroom before calling Greyhound to get the price of a ticket to Oakleaf, Texas. She thanked the bored woman and hung up just as her mother was walking back into the room. While Su Lin was gathering the money for a bus ticket, Dr. Claude Iverneck had confirmed that the car was in drivable condition. The seller, Jericho Tilly, claimed that it ran just as good if not better than the day it rolled off the assembly line. He also assured Claude that it was 100% original. Do you believe him? It was my older brother's. Then when he went to Nam, he left it with me, said he'd do terrible things if I even got a scratch on it, the man claimed. And he didn't want it back? Claude asked. He, uh, he lost both legs over there, Jericho said quietly. Inga agreed to take Charles a day earlier she did, after all, love her baby boy. Charles was also happy that he'd be spending some time with his mother. Tuff pretended to be upset that Claude was taking a rare day off from work, but agreed they'd possibly, maybe manage to keep running without the head of their engineering department at the helm. While Claude was gathering the cash together, Su Lin was sitting on a Greyhound bus, heading west. She looked out the window as Stepping Stone, Louisiana, disappeared from view. The bus stopped for 48 minutes in Pin Oak, Louisiana, and Su Lin bought a shrimp sandwich and soda. She put on a lot of hot sauce and hummed happily as she ate the sandwich. She ignored the three young men that vied for her attention, but did think that maybe her top and shorts may not have been the best choice for travel attire. Her studious disregard of the young men only seemed to encourage them. One of them broke away and came up to her as she sat on the bench, chewing her meal. So, uh, where are you heading? The Latin youth bravely asked her. Oakleaf Correctional, my husband's being released tomorrow, Su Lin said calmly. He was in for a serious crime, but the last witness? Just died so there's no one left who saw him do it. She had no idea if there was such a place named Oakleaf Correctional. But Su Lin was also willing to bet the arrogant young man didn't know if there was either. The young man muttered something in Spanish and quickly left Su Lin. She did not smirk just finished her sandwich, then used the restroom. Two hours later, the bus pulled up in front of the Degard Inn. Su Lin looked around with great interest her friend Joanne and Joanne's spouse Joey attended the University of Louisiana at DeGarde. Through the window, she could see some buildings at a distance and wondered if that might be the college. The bus was quite full when Dr. Claude Iverneck stepped onto the bus. He scanned the seats, walking up the aisle and soon saw that all were occupied. Seat right here an attractive young blonde girl offered. Thank you, he said, smiling down at the girl. He was six feet three inches, so towered over the girl as he put his small suitcase into the overhead compartment. He held onto his briefcase tightly as he settled into his seat. Do you know where the university is? Su Lin asked the tall, handsome man. Yes, that's it, right there he said as the bus started moving. There, she said, pointing to the building she had noticed earlier. Yes, and there, that is where I work, doctor. Claude smiled as he pointed out the Kendrick's engineering building. And there, 
We are building a new building to make hydraulic pumps and possibly the key Charles generator maybe where are you from? The girl asked, smiling at his odd accent. When I was a little boy? We lived in Tremblink, Poland. Then my father moved us to West Germany, Claude smiled. He cursed himself for leaving his tablet on his desk at work. He had downloaded a book on perpetual motion and perpetual energy. He had hoped to study the theory the author had proposed at a symposium in Finland three years ago. So how long have you been in America? Su Lin asked. I moved here two years after finishing the University of Hamburg, so that is 23 years now, Claude admitted. I've been in Louisiana all my life, Su Lin admitted. By the time they reached Houston, Texas, Su Lin was tired from the journey. She walked wearily to where the bus heading for Oakleaf would depart. An employee of Greyhound told Su Lin it would be another 93 minutes before that bus would depart. It's not even here yet it's coming from Shreveport, the man smiled. Where is your suitcase? Claude asked the girl. I don't have one, Su Lin said. Where are your clothes? Your makeup? Claude asked. I have my makeup right here, Su Lin said, showing him the small purse. Claude bought Su Lin a sandwich and a juice inside the large terminal. Then they sat on the bench in front of where their bus would be and ate. By the time the bus finally arrived, Su Lin was asleep, leaning against Dr. Claude Iverneck. The driver smiled as the tall man woke up his companion. Your daughter seems really exhausted, huh? The man said. It was a long trip, Claude responded, not correcting the man's assumption. Even though this bus had many available seats, Claude and Su Lin sat together. So what's the plan when we get to Oakleaf? He asked her. He checked his watch. By the time we get there, it will be 11 o'clock. Maybe later, he said. I don't know. I'll just call April and see what's up, Su Lin shrugged. And if you can't get in touch with her? Claude persisted. I'll figure something out, Su Lin shrugged. Su Lin fell asleep as the bus rumbled toward Oakleaf, Texas. She leaned heavily against Claude, snoring lightly. She did not wake when the bus stopped in Great Oak or in Sweet Oak. Claude gently shook her awake when the driver announced that their next stop was Oakleaf. Feeling groggy, she looked around for a phone booth. I have a cell phone right here, Claude said. Thanks, Su Lin said. She dialed the number. It rang four times. Then April's roommate's answering machine picked up. Oh no, Su Lin said. Come, I have a room here, Claude said. Su Lin obediently followed. The man checked in and took the electronic key from the bored-looking woman. I thought you said it was for one person, the clerk asked. I changed my mind, was Claude's response. God, I smell Su Lin murmured as she and Claude walked to room 133. It's okay, I'll pay for a shower, Claude teased. Oh good, she smiled. Before Claude could insist that he needed to go to the bathroom first, Su Lin was in the small, clean bathroom. She turned on the taps and climbed into the deep tub. When Claude heard the shower stop, he waited a few moments. You okay? What are you going to sleep in? Claude asked through the heavy door. Just my clothes, Su Lin called back as she toweled her hair. The ones that smell bad from the road? Claude asked. He pulled his undershirt out of his suitcase. Here, you can wear this, he insisted, handing the undershirt through the partially open door. Thanks, Su Lin said, taking the tank top. When Claude heard the motel's cheap hair dryer start up, he knocked on the bathroom door again. Su Lin, I really need to go to the bathroom. Can you hurry up? He demanded. Oh, I'm so sorry, Su Lin said and opened the door. Claude didn't notice any of this. He was desperate to use the bathroom. Then he stepped out of the bathroom and found his pajamas in his small suitcase. By the way, you can keep it, Su Lin teased. Oh? I'll tickle you, Claude threatened, smiling. He showered quickly and put on his pajamas. Then he brushed his teeth and hoped that Inga remembered to have Charles floss his teeth. The boy didn't like flossing and would complain throughout. But their dentist said it was important to teach him good oral hygiene habits as soon as possible. What are you watching, Claude asked when he entered the main room. Heard that girl tell you they had movies, Su Lin said as she sat on the bed, watching a movie. But this, this is inappropriate. Claude exclaimed. You're an engineer, how do you manage to perform such difficult stunts? Su Lin giggled as Claude blushed. I don't know, Claude said tightly. Really? You've never? Su Lin asked, watching another trick being performed. Let's see. Su Lin murmured and the menu appeared on the screen again. Acrobatics, baseball, ballet, here we go. Acrobatic. She hit enter and the screen showed a girl performing impressive acrobatic moves. Su Lin then leaned against Claude, resting her head on his shoulder. Claude turned his head to protest her leaning against him. 
to protest the inappropriate movie they were watching. When he turned his head, Su Lin's hand touched his face, and she leaned up. Thank you, Claude, she whispered, and hugged him. Thanks. What was that for Claude asked when she pulled away? For letting me stay in here with you. For giving me your shirt, Su Lin whispered into his chest. You're welcome, he murmured. On the screen, the girl was energetically performing different acrobatic moves. Su Lin looked at his ring finger. She squinted in the dimly lit room, but could see no faint tan lines. Satisfied, she took his hand. Claude did one last visual inspection of the room, grabbed his small suitcase and briefcase, and they left the room. Thanks, is everything all right? A clerk asked as Claude turned in the room key. Yes, everything is good, Claude agreed. Now, where is a place to get breakfast? Oakleaf Diner is right there across the street, Su Lin said, looking through the glass doors at the truck stop. Excellent, Claude said. Now, where is, ah, 1217 Big Street cross the street? Two blocks to the left, take a right, and it's about three blocks down, Sugar the woman said, pointing. Give me the suitcase Su Lin demanded as they left the motel. I'll carry it, good Claude said. Inside the diner, Claude called Jericho Tilly and let him know they were eating breakfast, and then they'd be at the location afterward. Just knock on the side door, the man said. Su Lin ordered the steak and eggs and amused Claude when she ate her entire breakfast and even stole a biscuit from his plate. Then she went to the restroom. As she returned, Claude watched as a burly trucker tried to intercept Su Lin. Inga would have paused, would have flirted lightly. Inga would have also kept an eye on Claude to see if she was making him upset. If Claude was becoming upset, then Inga would ramp up her flirting. She played a lot of games like that Claude thought to himself. Su Lin didn't even pause. The trucker reached out a hand to stop her forward progress and Su Lin just ducked underneath the man's outstretched arm and continued walking. There were a few snorts of laughter. The trucker turned and glared at Su Lin. When the girl sat down at the table, the trucker included Claude in his glare of anger. Let it go, Jimbo, just let it go, the girl, didn't want to talk to you, the waitress, ordered the upset man. Freaking jerk Jimbo growled and stomped away. Ready to go? Su Lin asked as she drained her cup of coffee. Aha, Claude agreed. They walked along the busy street, then turned and traveled along the side street. Claude couldn't help but think that city blocks in Texas must be a lot longer than city blocks in Louisiana. And this is it, Claude said, checking the mailbox. Good, my legs are about to fall off, Su Lin giggled. How far do you think we walked? Yes, those flip-flops aren't good for walking, Claude agreed. Jericho Tilly brought the couple to the garage in the rear of the property. Claude smirked Jericho was talking to him, but Jericho couldn't take his eyes off of Su Lin. Wow. Su Lin gasped when the man pulled the tarp off of the car. It was white, with a red vinyl convertible top and red vinyl seats. Wow. This is big. The hood alone must be huge, right? Su Lin said, looking at the 1964 Chevrolet Corvette. When I came to America, my next door neighbor had one just like this Claude said as he admired the automobile. I said to myself, I will get one well, Claude. This Corvette can be yours if the price is right. Jericho said, imitating the game show announcer for the Price is Right television show. 69,000, right? Claude asked. Right, Jericho said, watching as Su Lin bent over, looking inside the car. So why are you selling this? Su Lin suddenly asked. Well, uh, I, well, the doctor says I have cancer, Jericho admitted, and I have two boys. If I leave the car to one, the other one will get upset. So this way, I can just give them each half the money and let them go get whatever they want. Sorry about the cancer, Su Lin said softly, putting a comforting hand on Jericho's arm. Yeah, well, it happens, huh? The man smiled. I can test drive it? Claude demanded. Yeah, I would expect you to, Jericho agreed. Claude handed his briefcase to Su Lin. He smiled broadly as he opened the door of the car and slid into the low-slung automobile. Claude flexed his hands on the steering wheel a few times. Then he started the car. He sat, listening to the sound of a finely made engine running. He eased the car out of the garage, then drove away. You, uh, want a cup of coffee or something? Jericho offered Su Lin. Don't make that crazy hazelnut stuff, okay? Su Lin asked, following Jericho to the house. Hey dad, some guy just drove off in, whoa. A man in his early 30s said, then came up short when he saw Su Lin. My oldest, Elroy Tilly Jericho said, indicating the young man who now flexed his bare chest. Hey, Su Lin said, 
And uh, no ma I am, this is honest to goodness real coffee Jericho continued as he poured them each a mug of the thick brew. Oh yeah, the car Elroy asked, tearing his eyes from Sue Lin. Her daddy's going to buy it, Jericho said. Oh no, he's not my daddy, Sue Lin smiled as she blew on her mug of coffee. He's my man. Wow, Jericho chuckled. You, that vet, and a cold glass of water is all it would take to give him a heart attack, huh? Ten minutes later, Claude came roaring up to the house. He got out of the automobile with some reluctance, then knocked on the side door. It was Sue Lin who opened the door. So daddy, do you like it? She asked. Yes, I like it. I love it, Claude agreed. Claude entered the house. For a brief moment, his eyes narrowed at the sight of the handsome young Elroy as Elroy posed and flexed, shirtless. Then he smiled softly. The young man looked almost desperate, but Sue Lin never took notice of him. Briefcase? Claude asked. Su Lin grabbed it from under the kitchen table and handed it to Claude. Jericho invited Claude to sit down. Su Lin immediately sat down to Claude's right and immediately upon sitting, put her hand on Claude's arm. The young man left the kitchen. Well, all right, I just need to sign some papers and you two can be on your way, Jericho said. Do you have the money? Claude opened the briefcase and Su Lin's eyes went wide at the sight of $69,000 in bundles of $100 bills. Jericho slowly counted it all out. Oh, and the tarp? That's a custom-fitted cover, Jericho suddenly said. I was going to sell it on eBay, but your girlfriend here convinced me to just throw it in with the car. I told him he didn't know how long it'd take to sell that thing, Su Lin said to Claude. My girlfriend? D. She's a smart cookie, Claude said, and continued to read the sales contract. A.W. Su Lin said, putting her head on Claude's shoulder. 68 and... 69 Jericho counted. I'll just sign this title, and you, my friend, are the proud owner of a 1964 Corvette. One of the finest machines ever built, come on, girlfriend Claude said, grabbing his empty briefcase and his small suitcase. I'll get the car cover, Sue Lin said, yanking the kitchen door open. Brother, how did you, I mean, wow. Jericho praised as they both watched Sue Lin trot to the garage. Don't drag it, Claude cautioned. Well, duh, no kidding, Su Lin called back as she began rolling the cover into a ball. How did I find her? Claude asked, then shrugged his shoulders. Su Lin's eyes again filled with tears when Claude suggested she call April. Su Lin, really, isn't it silly? You came all this way and then didn't see your friend? Claude asked as they backed the car out of Jericho's driveway. Yeah, you're right, Su Lin agreed. Jesus, what? What the heck is the time? April's roommate angrily demanded when she picked up the telephone. Is April there? Su Lin asked over the woman's outburst. Gosh, she's sleeping. What do you think? The girl snapped and hung up. She's not home, Su Lin said, handing Claude his cell phone. Let's go. Claude lightly touched her face. Su Lin turned and looked up at him, light brown eyes shiny. Okay, let's go where? He asked softly. She hung her head. He gently touched her face again but she brushed his hand away. Stepping stone, I guess she mumbled. You really want to go to the stepping stone? Claude asked. Heck no, Su Lin choked out. Why do you think I just hopped on the bus? Claude sat silent for a long moment. Then he put the car into gear and began negotiating the streets of Oakleaf, searching for the interstate. By the time they reached Lake Charles, Louisiana, Su Lin was smiling. Claude had put the top down and she delighted in holding her hands up, making them flutter in the breeze created by the wind. Ja, this convertible is perfect for a pretty blonde like you. Claude laughed as he pulled up to the Cracker Barrel in Lake Charles. Again, Sue Lin amused Claude as she devoured a sunrise sampler breakfast, then nibbled on his catfish dinner. She also gulped down two orange cream sodas. Ooh, I have to go to the restroom, she suddenly declared. I'm not surprised you'll burst if you don't, Claude teased, and she flashed him a grin. Gosh, mister, I was jealous when I saw the car. Another man said when Claude and Sue Lin approached the Corvette, but looking at her. Now I'm really jealous. Sue Lin smiled but didn't respond to the man as Claude opened her door for her. Then, when Claude got into the driver's seat, Sue Lin reached over and pulled Claude in for a hug. Just to make him extra jealous, Sue Lin whispered. Claude smiled and started the powerful engine. Then, with a nod to his admiring audience of one, he drove away. Su Lin looked over at Claude questioningly when Claude took the DeGard exit off of I-10. Claude negotiated the streets, then finally pulled to a stop in front of a large home. Where's this? 
Su Lin asked. My house Claude said as he got out of the idling car. He entered the code, then got back into the car as the garage door slid up. He pulled the car into the garage and got out again. Then he came around and opened Su Lin's door. Welcome to my home, my little Su Lin, he said. She took his large hand and followed him to the door of the garage. He entered another code on a keypad, and when the light turned green, Claude unlocked the door and led Su Lin into the kitchen of his home. Su Lin looked around, even touched a few things. She smiled at Charles Booster's seat. Then she followed Claude as he walked from the kitchen to the living room. Again, she looked around. She looked at the large television and smiled at Claude. Do they have movies on here? She asked playfully. What movies? Claude asked. The ones like we were watching last night, the ones with all the action Su Lin giggled. Do you really need movies? We have the real thing right here, Claude said. Yeah, but they're fun, Su Lin argued. Now, where's our room? Aren't you tired? Yes, I am tired, Claude admitted. Su Lin grabbed his hand and he led her to his bedroom. She looked at his California king bed and smiled as she kicked off her flip-flops. It's huge. Su Lin giggled. We can get lost in this bed, huh? Okay, this is the north, that is the south. Then there's east and west, Claude pointed out the cardinal directions. If you ever get lost, just tell me if you're heading north, south, east, or west, and I'll find you, okay? Okay, Su Lin giggled, shrugging out of her shorts and halter top. She scrambled onto the bed and waited for him. He kicked off his own shoes, then unbuttoned his shirt. Which side do you sleep on? Su Lin asked. Guess, Claude said. Um, the east side? Su Lin guessed. Yes, and how did you know that? Claude asked. The clock is right there. There are two pillows on that side, and only one on this side, Su Lin explained. Very good, Claude smiled. Oh, someone's not tired, Su Lin cooed as she saw Claude's hard. You know. Oh, but I am. I am so very tired, Claude teased as he crawled onto the bed. Fine, go to sleep, Su Lin said. She got dressed, then spent a few minutes brushing the tangles out of her long blonde hair. Claude was dressed in slacks and a dress shirt and pulling on his dress shoes as she finished off her hair by securing it with a hairband, creating a long ponytail. I must be crazy. I have lost my mind, Claude said to himself as the very youthful-looking girl followed him to the garage. He grabbed the remote control from his car and placed it on the visor of his classic Corvette. So, where are we going? She asked, leaning against him. First, we're going to Abdul's. You need some clothes, Claude announced. I'm so excited, Su Lin exclaimed. I've never been to Abdul's. What do they have there? A little bit of everything, Claude replied. Inside the stylish store, Su Lin picked up a pair of jeans and held them against herself, shaking her head. She looked around. Do they have a section for petite sizes? She asked Claude. None of this stuff is going to fit me. A saleswoman pointed to the petite section, and Su Lin nodded approvingly. She looked up at Claude. Okay, what are we getting? She asked. First, you need something to wear when we go out to eat. Then, maybe something comfortable to relax in around the house, he said. I have your shirt, Su Lin reminded him. And I have a four-year-old boy, Claude said. Oh, Su Lin said, understanding. She picked out two blouses, three pairs of shorts, two pairs of blue jeans, a button-up blouse, and a few t-shirts. She also selected three dresses and a cute nightgown. After that, Su Lin dragged him to the shoe section and picked out two pairs of shoes, a pair of dress pumps, and a pair of tennis shoes. Thank you, sweetie Su Lin said simply as they put the purchases into the trunk of the car. Well, I am just glad you did not see the jewelry counter Claude half-joked. Oh, where was it? Su Lin asked, eyes wide. Nowhere, never mind, I am joking. Abdul's does not have jewelry counter Claude said quickly. So, we going out eat now? Su Lin asked. Yeah, we go back to house, you dress? Then we go, Claude said. What? Open the trunk again, Su Lin said. She grabbed a dress. Then, to Claude's amazement and exciting delight, she dropped her halter top into the seat of the car, then pulled the dress on. Grab my shoes, she ordered, and got into the car. Well then, okay, let's go eat, Claude agreed. Thank you. Sweetie Su Lin said again when Claude got into the car. Side-by-side -side steakhouse had a 15-minute wait. Su Lin leaned against Claude, rocking slightly as they waited. Soon enough, the hostess led them to a table, wished them a good meal, and left. I can get me a ribeye? Su Lin asked, reading the heavy menu. You can get whatever you want, Claude assured her. She got the ribeye, a loaded baked potato, and the broccoli and cheese. What's this? 
I didn't, you order this? Su Lin asked when the waitress put the endive salad in front of her. Come with meal, Claude explained. It's endive salad. On what? Su Lin giggled at the odd sounding word. Just eat it, Claude Mock growled at her. Ooh, daddy's mad, huh? Su Lin smiled and did spear some of the salad. Su Lin managed to eat all of her salad. Two baskets of the hot hand formed dinner rolls, all of her steak, potato, and broccoli dish. Wow, where are you putting all that? Claude asked. The waitress did mention the desserts, but Su Lin confessed the last three or four bites had been a struggle. Claude put his credit card down and smiled at his lovely dinner companion. For her part, Su Lin was glancing around the opulent steakhouse, at the rich decor, the elegant setting. She frowned slightly, then turned to look at Claude. Uh, okay, at your four o'clock? You know that woman? Su Lin asked, discreetly pointing toward Claude's right shoulder. Claude peered around and saw a darkly scowling Inga and a bored-looking Jerome. Yes, my little Su Lin, he smiled widely. That is my ex-wife and her boyfriend. Got a thing for us blondes here? Su Lin smiled, tugging a lock of her blonde hair. But where is Charles Claude suddenly asked himself. The waitress returned and wished them a good night. Claude signed the check, pocketed the receipt, and assisted Su Lin to her feet. Home again, Ch Claude brought the bags of clothing to his bedroom and arranged some closet space for her. He also cleared out a dresser drawer for her, and she smiled and put her new clothes away. She said she was Baptist, but agreed that God would be present in the Lutheran church as well. A few of Claude's acquaintances did look twice when he and Sue Lin entered Atonement Lutheran Church in Kimball, Louisiana. He nodded politely to them and then talked with Sue Lin in hushed tones. Because the Corvette was a two-seater, Sue Lin did not go with Claude when he drove to Inga's condominium to pick up Charles. Inga put on a smile, but her eyes were blazing as she spoke to Claude. So, uh, who was that girl I saw you with on Saturday? She growled under her breath. Su Lin. But she is not girl, Claude said. But, uh, where was Charles while you and the friend were at the restaurant? Heacham. His sister babysit Inga snapped, letting the friend comment slide. Stepping outside, Inga's eyes opened wide at the sight of the classic automobile. Then her eyes narrowed. You have enough money to buy this? She snarled. My lawyer will be very interested in hearing about this. What? Claude laughed. No, no, this is Sue Lin's car. See? I tell you she is no girl? She? That? This is her car? Inga sputtered, admiring the long, sleek vehicle. Cool. Charles enthused. His very cool Claude agreed and buckled the child into the car seat. Charles and Sue Lin's meeting could not have gone better. She smiled, hugged him tightly, then begged him to show her his room. In his room, Su Lin pretended she had no idea what his dump truck did, what his crane did, what his backhoe did. Wow, Daddy, did you know you had such a smart little boy? Su Lin praised as she carried Charles to the kitchen for their dinner. Yes, he is genius, wonderkind Claude enthused. But I bet he doesn't eat green beans, does he? Su Lin asked. Ah, Charles said and ate his green beans. He hates green beans, Claude confided to Su Lin. She was dutifully impressed by the electromagnet and ran around the small workshop, finding things for the device to pick up. At 8.30, Claude had to threaten them both with punishment before Charles would take his bath. I love you, Sue Lin Charles declared. Oh, well, I love you too. Charlie Ivernick Sue Lin smiled as she and Claude bathed the four-year-old boy. Charles finally drifted off to sleep. Sue Lin smiled as she entered the bedroom she, she shared with Claude. It was very sweet when he said he loves you, Claude commented. Well, I love him too, Su Lin said. She put on her tank top sleep shirt. Then she climbed into the bed. And I love daddy too, she said. She put her head on his chest. Very much, she said. He combed his fingers through her long strands of hair and she sighed happily. At work, Tough Richards admired the long classic car. Then the CEO helped his head engineer pull the tarp over the car. Looks like you're enjoying that bonus, Tough said. More than you'd know, Claude said, smiling as the trio of tough Charles and Claude entered Kendrick's engineering. At 11.49, Denise Lacombe, who was covering the reception area, paged Claude. Sir? There's a girl here, claiming to be your girlfriend, Denise whispered urgently into her headset. Girlfriend. Tough asked as Denise whispered through the intercom on Claude's desk. Yes, girlfriend, okay? Car not only thing I get with bonus, mister. Nosy Claude joked. Oh, this I got to see, Tuff said, bolting out of Claude's cramped, cluttered office. Darn it. Tuff, Ezekiel Richards, you don't, 
You get back here, Claude yelled as he bolted from his office. Hi, baby Su Lin smiled when Claude burst into the reception area. That Miss Corliss? She run me out of the house, said I was getting in the way. So, where are you taking me for lunch? She wore her hair pulled back in a ponytail, had on the khaki shorts and one of the tops Claude had bought for her. On her feet, she had her customary flip-flops, which she now dangled off one foot as she stretched up for a hug. Wow, Tuff said. Just, wow. Wow, indeed. Tuff Richards. This my girlfriend, Sue Lynn Benning. Sue Lynn, this is Tuff Richards. He is CEO of the company Claude introduced the two. And lunch. We have a lunchroom here. I eat with Charles. Oh, good. Sue Lynn enthused. Hi, Mr. Tuff. Nice to meet you. Wow, Tuff said again and walked away. Hi, Sue Lin. Charles happily greeted the young woman. Sue Lin smiled as Charles showed her what he was working on. She smiled as he introduced her to his teachers at the factory's nursery. So what would you like to get? Sue Lin asked as she held onto Charles's hand in the lunchroom. On Wednesday, Inga found an excuse not to see Charles. This was fine with Claude. He and Sue Lin had already planned on taking Charles to the university's planetarium for a one-night showing. He'd been in the process of punching Inga's number to ask her to switch Thursday. So it was not until Friday that Inga Iverneck heard that her husband had a woman staying the night at his house. It wasn't until Friday that Inga heard about Sue Lin, Daddy's girlfriend. Inga smiled and feigned interest in Charles' new friend, in Daddy's new friend. Then, the moment Charles was asleep, Inga angrily mashed the number seven on her phone. Yes? Claude asked. Sue Lin took advantage of this distraction and speared one of his shrimp scampi. Claude smirked at Su Lin's smile of triumph. Yes, Inga, what is it? Claude asked. He frowned and put up a hand to stop Su Lin's stealthy movement toward another of his shrimp. She pouted, but ceased her attack. Okay, once we are finished, need to go to Stepping Stone, Claude snapped, disconnecting his call. What? Why? Su Lin asked, dismayed. To get your birth certificate, Claude snapped. I cannot believe she is saying she will sue me for custody. Why is she suing you for custody? Su Lin asked, digging in her small purse. Because I have my lover, my girlfriend living with me. It is a bad influence on our son. Claude said and scooped up a large forkful of his meal. Here. When I figured I was moving to Oak Ridge, I grabbed it, Su Lin said, producing her birth certificate. Oakleaf, but that is wonderful, Claude said, examining Su Lin's birth certificate. And, uh, can't tell me her boyfriend doesn't ever spend the night, huh? Su Lin said and finished her manicotti. Leave my food alone, you little rascal Claude demanded as she reached for a piece of his garlic bread. What? She laughed out loud. What did you call me? Claude waved the waiter down, apologized, but asked for the check. I am very sorry, but we are in quite the hurry, he stated. Oh, but of course the waiter said. Why are we in a hurry? Su Lin asked, chomping on the piece of garlic bread. And where did you get that? Claude asked, eyeing her bread. They gave me their Su Lin lied pointing to another table. Su Lin. They did not, Claude laughed. Su Lin skipped to keep up with the rushing Claude. She was grateful when they reached his car and she was able to stop and buckle up. They pulled up to David's jewelry on Highway 19. Su Lin looked at him as he hurried to the door. The door buzzed and Claude held the door open for Su Lin. Baby, what? What are we doing here? Su Lin asked, looking around at the jewelry counters. We need an engagement ring, Claude announced to David the proprietor of the shop. Su Lin gasped. Come, come, we have an 11.30 flight to Las Vegas, Claude said, as David unlocked a display case. We what? Su Lin gasped again. My second wedding was in Las Vegas, David offered. Claude, baby, are you serious? Su Lin asked, actually feeling lightheaded. I am very serious, Claude said. White gold? Yes, white gold would be best, I think. Have these over here, nice sapphire solitaire David offered. Try it on, Claude demanded of Su Lin. It's just a little bit big, Su Lin said. HMA, let's see, David mused, checking the ring size. So you're probably about a size five. HM? I guess Su Lin agreed. But baby, are you serious about this? Have never been more serious about anything in my life, Claude stated, and nodded approvingly as David found another ring. Oh, that's pretty. Su Lin approved as she tried the diamond and ruby ring. We have these matching bands. What size ring do you wear, stretch? David said. Stretch Su Lin giggled, looking at the ring in the light of the shop. Twelve, sometimes twelve and a half Claude smiled as Su Lin giggled. I am losing my mind, I am completely insane. 
Claude thought as he pushed his powerful sports car toward Lafayette's small airport. Las Vegas is the wedding capital of the world. Claude was able to get a videographer, a photographer, and a minister and chapel reserved within an hour of their landing. He also found a beautiful gown for his bride and a nice tuxedo for himself. You won't, I promise you, baby. I'm going to be the best wife ever, Su Lin tearfully promised as she held tightly onto the bouquet. I believe you, pup, Claude smiled. And I will be a good husband to you. I can throw out my birth control pills? Su Lin asked just as the minister called them forward. I have lost my mind, Claude smiled as the photographer took a series of shots. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, the minister intoned, hamming it up slightly for the video camera. The casino rented them a nice suite for $340. A woman in a wedding gown and a man in a tuxedo with no luggage is not an uncommon sight in Las Vegas. The desk clerk smiled knowingly and wished them a good night. The wedding dress had come with a vinyl bag. It was the only luggage they had for their return flight, and Su Lin carefully packed the dress around their photo book and three copies of their wedding discs as a carry-on. The flight attendant didn't ask Su Lin for identification, as she poured them each a plastic cup of sparkling apple juice to toast their marriage. Thank you, Su Lin smiled at the older woman. You're welcome, sweetie, and congratulations, the woman smiled. And at 6.30 Sunday evening, when Claude pulled up in his 1964 Corvette, Ingress smiled triumphantly. Claude smiled a serene smile and asked if Charles was ready yet. I told you the other night, I will not let you expose Charles to immoral behavior, Inga exclaimed. Immoral behavior? What immoral behavior? Claude asked innocently. You're living with a woman, being with my son in the house, Inga said, smiling. Oh yes, I am having a lot of close moments with Su Lin, Claude readily agreed. He held out his left hand. Inga's triumphant smile began to fade. But after all, we are married, Claude said. Now, it's 6.30. Is my son ready? You, you're not married, Inga snarled, her face twisted in a mask of anger. It's not true. I won't let you. I have a ring. I have pictures, I have video, I even have a license. Yes, I would say. I am married, Claude chuckled. Again, Inga, is my son ready? I don't believe you, Inga cried out. And I will not let you have Charles. Inga had already told Babbage's department store that she wouldn't be taking the job. Inga had already informed Tanisha Brown-Jones, Jerome's cousin, to file for a significant amount of child support. Both the note on her condo and the association fees were passed due Tanisha had planned to expedite the first child support payment. And Tanisha said, if Inga was receiving child support for Charles, she should also be able to request financial support for herself. I mean, gosh, girl, I don't know why that Nicole Banks never asked for any of that. You know what I'm saying? The new attorney had laughed. Now Inga saw her plans falling apart. If Claude's claims were true, then she had no hope of receiving full custody, no hope of receiving child support or financial support. You will let me have our son. I am the custodial parent, Claude said no longer smiling. If you don't, I will call the police. I will show them the court papers. Realizing she had lost, Inga angrily slammed the door in Claude's face. Then she made Charles cry as she roughly pulled the four-year-old by his arm to the front door. At their home, Su Lin calmed the tearful boy down. Then she and Charles played with his Hot Wheels racetrack while Claude prepared their dinner. After finishing his meal, Su Lin bathed the child, then dressed him in his pajamas. Both Su Lin and Charles called for Daddy, declaring that it was time for a bedtime story. Then, before Claude could make his way down the hall to his home office, Su Lin pulled him into their bedroom. She softly closed the door. That, was that the only reason we got married? Su Lin asked quietly. Claude was about to answer yes, but then he saw the tears slowly streaming down Su Lin's face. He pulled her closer and hugged her. Su Lin, I won't lie to you. A good husband doesn't lie to his wife, Claude said. He hugged her again. Then, he did lie to her. Su Lin, she, my wife Inga, my ex-wife Inga. She threatened to take Charles away from me, from us, Claude said. But really, what did Inga do? She made me, darn it, what is it Tuff says? She made me go for it. He lifted her tearful face to look at him. Inga says she will take Charles away because we are being wrong, Claude said. And I say, how can it be wrong? She loves me, and I love her. It is not wrong. But if we are married then it is truly not wrong. It is right and it is good. But the only reason, Su Lin said. The main reason, not the only reason, the main reason is because I have lost my mind. I am crazy about you, Claude insisted. 
The main reason is because I am in love with amazing girl from Stepping Stone. Inga? She may have rushed us, but no, Su Lin. Inga is not the only reason I asked you. I begged you. Please marry me. Ah, Su Lin suddenly cried out. Stepping. My mama. I didn't even tell my mama. Claude smiled as his wife ran to the telephone. She grabbed the phone and dialed the number quickly. Mama? Hey, it's me, Su Lin said after a long moment of waiting. No, no, mama. I'm not calling for money, Su Lin said. No, mama, listen. Listen. Mama. Listen, okay? Su Lin's happy expression had turned into one of anger. Claude couldn't hear the words, but he could hear the metallic barks as Su Lin held the phone slightly away from her ear, and that was enough to understand the conversation. Mama, but you need to be quiet for a moment so I can tell you why I called Su Lin snapped. More metallic barks came from the phone. Mama, I'm married. No, I'm not expecting a baby, but I am married, Su Lin snapped. She listened for a few more moments then simply hung up the phone and stared at it for a long moment. But don't worry, Mama Su Lin said to the silent phone. I love him and he loves me, and we'll be just fine, okay? Su Lin turned and looked at Claude. She walked slowly towards him with her arms wide open. We'll be just fine, right? She asked. Yes, we'll be just fine, Claude agreed. 